tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Ever wonder what it would feel like to be shot out of a cannon? Yeah, me neither. I have wondered what it would feel like to ride in a barrel over Niagara Falls. On October 24, 1901, a 63-year-old school teacher named Annie Edson Taylor became the first person to successfully take the plunge over Niagara Falls in a barrel. One dude took a kayak over the falls, while another a jet ski. Yep, neither lived. By the way, if you survive no matter the method, you're going to jail. That crazy shit is illegal. Speaking of crazy, two stories to get the heart racing tonight from Keisto Healy and newcomer to Fear from the Heartland, Man with Two Faces. Let's get after it. An ancient coin deposited into a payphone creates a conduit for demons from hell to invade, all to appease a slighted witch. It's circa mid-1980s. Three kids are all that stand in the way of death and carnage in their beloved hometown. With only their wits at their disposal, never a more trying time shall they ever have to face. Now, for your indulgence, Damned Payphone by Kisto Healy. Gary came out of his house, letting the screen door slam behind him. His best bud, ultimate nemesis, Ray, was waiting on his bicycle at the edge of his lawn. Gary ignored the spitballs Ray was sending his way and went around the side of his house to his bike, pushing up the kickstand with his foot and hopping on. He was glad he was bundled against the winter chill as he could see his breath like plumes of smoke. While I was waiting for you, I made it through the labyrinth, so now David Bowie is pissed at you, Ray said, putting away his spitball gun, aka pen tube, with no ink in it. Gary rolled his eyes as he pedaled into the street. No way you escaped David Bowie on a BMX. Everyone knows Huffy is better. The boys rode beside each other, racing through the streets. We'll settle this on the new Rampage game when we get to the rink, Ray said. Fine, but you can't be the werewolf, Gary answered as he pedaled by. It's got to be Kong versus Zilla for a true classic battle. I just watched it at Thanksgiving again. I love that. You're on. The boys rode their bikes across town to the roller rink, where they skidded to a halt. I win, Gary said. Told you, Huffy. It was a tie, loser. The door opened and a girl stepped out in rainbow leggings and overalls with her brown hair and pigtails and her eyes wide with fear. Oh no, it's Punky Brewster, Ray said with a snort. Hope you had your cootie shot. Shut up, dude, Gary waved at the girl. Hey, Lucy. Lucy walked up to them, her eyes distant and full of terror. Behind her, the door fell shut, cutting off the sound of Tears for Fears playing inside. What the heck is wrong with you? Ray asked her. Lucy turned slowly and looked him in the eyes. It's the payphone, she said. 
Then she whipped around and pointed at the maintenance hole in the street. You're being kind of creepy, Gary told her. He looked over at the maintenance hole she was pointing at. The cover jumped and rattled. The two boys paid wary glances towards each other and then both looked at Lucy. Okay, what the hell was that? That was hell, Lucy said. The boys looked back at the maintenance hole cover and it jumped again, landing at an angle this time and exposing the hole beneath. Thick gray taloned fingers emerged from the darkness. Both boys yelped, dropped their bikes, and ran into the building. People were happily dancing laps on the rink while others were pulling skates on and taking them off on the other side of the big room. A disco globe spun above, scattering multicolored lights over the skaters while the speakers crooned, Everybody wants to rule the world. Was that a chud? Ray asked, trembling from nerves. I think we just saw a chud, dude. Chuds aren't real, Gary answered, but he glared at Lucy. What was that? Tell him. Probably a demon, she said. Come on. Gary and Ray glanced at each other, but they followed behind her. They walked past the skaters that didn't look at all frightened. They walked past the tables where kids were eating slices of pizza and sipping sodas from wax-coated cups. Lucy stopped beside the payphone. Can you please just stop being a weirdo and tell us what's going on? Ray huffed. Lucy rolled her eyes. She cracked the gum in her mouth. Pick up the phone and try to call someone. Should I call Santa? Ray smirked and shook his head. He gestured towards an arcade game across the way. Heck no, I'm saving my quarters for Rampage. You do it and just let me hear. Lucy sighed. Fine. She dropped a quarter into the appropriate slot on the phone. I'm going to call your house, Gary. Gary shrugged and she dialed, punching the silver buttons. Then she reached past Ray and handed the phone to Gary, who reluctantly took it. Gary held the phone to his ear and listened, his eyes on Ray. He heard what sounded like a campfire, flames crackling and popping. He squinted his eyes and listened more carefully. It sounded like there was some kind of low moaning in the background. Hello? He said. Mom? Deep laughter came through the phone into his ear, accompanied by screams of terror and agony. Gary dropped the receiver and jumped back. Ray eyed him cautiously and then grabbed the hanging phone, putting it to his own ear. Hello, Ray. A booming voice full of bass said to him, I will see you at home. Ray slammed the phone down, hanging it up. He stared angrily at Lucy. Who was that? What is going on? Why did he say he would meet me at home? That was the devil, I think, Lucy said, cracking her gum again. Evan and those other mean boys were making fun of the old lady on the hill, calling her a witch and throwing stuff at her. I think they egged her house. Anyway, she followed them here and put some strange-looking coin in the payphone. Then she just left. Now the payphone calls hell, and whatever house you dialed, that's where the demons show up. I tested it by calling the main number for the rink. Joey at the desk didn't answer. She said, pointing at the older boy who waved back. But the devil did. And that's why that demon was coming out of the sewer outside? Ray asked in a panic. You just killed us all, you idiot! Wait, why'd you call my house? Gary cried out. You sent demons to my house? I thought we were friends. We are. So I called Ray's house. Ray snarled. I hate you so much. I gotta go save my parents. He ran past them before Gary could say anything, but he stopped in his tracks when the music cut off. He looked back at Gary and Lucy just as the power cut out. People immediately started screaming. Ray whirled back around and saw people hurrying off of the rink in a rush to get to their shoes and belongings. A hand clamped down on his shoulder and he yelped. He shook free of the hand and spun around, ready for battle. Gary raised his own hands defensively. We have to get to our bikes if we want to save your family and there are demons out there. Lucy cracked glow sticks and handed each boy one. These will help us see in the dark. Thanks, Gary said with a smile. I still hate you, Ray told her. The front door flew open with a bang as huge gusts of wind blew in. A ferocious growl sounded in the dark. The three kids watched as skinless creatures of gray bone crawled on all fours, moving fast and leaping onto fleeing skaters. The screams started again as blood sprayed the polished wood of the rink. Run! Lucy screamed, racing for the door. The boys pumped their arms and churned their legs behind her, barreling through the open doors. Each boy grabbed up their bicycles and both turned to look at Lucy. 
What about you? Handlebars? Gary asked, his eyes going back to the open doors and the sounds of chaos emitting from the darkness within the building. Lucy smiled and pointed down at her feet. The boys followed her finger as they did before and saw that she was wearing skates for the first time. Gary nodded and started to pedal away. Ray shot past him and Lucy worked to keep up, weaving back and forth on her skates. They heard padding feet and panting breaths like a dog running behind them. Curiosity mixed with fear forced them to turn their heads. The horned demon and its lone red eye made them turn back and pedal faster. I'm about to lead another demon right back to my house. This is all your fault, Ray barked at Lucy. Lucy ignored him. She reached back with something in her hand and liquid splashed onto the horrible face of the pursuing demon. Steam rose where it connected and it howled in pain and turned away from her, running off in the opposite direction. What was that? Carrie asked her. Laura's water. My mom orders it for the dishes in our doorways. We're Catholic, dude. And you just carry it around with you? Ray chimed in. I do since I saw Fright Night. You just never know anymore. Hey, just be glad she did, Gary said. Or we might all be demon food right now. If those things ate my parents, I'm going to feed you to them, Ray said, tugging the handles of his bike and sharply turning a corner. Whatever, Master Splinter. Is that supposed to be an insult? He's a rat, idiot. A freaking badass ninja rat. Guys, look, Gary shouted over their argument. He was pointing towards the maintenance hole cover on Ray's block. It was off to the side and the hole was open. That can't be good. Ray pedaled up to his house and jumped off his bike before he even stopped. He ran up the stoop to the door banging on it. Mom, open up. It's me. You think they'll ever make a cartoon of the Ninja Turtles? Lucy asked Gary. Probably not. It's pretty dark. Keep that holy water ready. A scream sounded inside the house and Ray moaned. He cried out for his mother and pounded on the door some more. I'll try the back, Gary told him. He dropped his bike and ran around the house. Suddenly, the front door came open and Ray was staring into his living room. No one was there to have opened the door. He swallowed a lump in his throat. Mom? Dad? When he got no response, he turned back and looked down the steps at Lucy. She shrugged. I don't think I can get up the steps in my skates. Ray grumbled under his breath, but he knew there was no time to argue, so he turned back and crossed the threshold. The house was dark, quiet, too quiet. He stepped forward with tentative steps, clutching to the glow stick Lucy had given him. Mom? Dad? Ray made his way to the kitchen, where he saw a note held to the fridge door by a magnet. His mother said that she and his father had gone out bowling with Gary's parents, and dinner was in the refrigerator. He sighed with relief until he heard snarling from behind him. Ray trembled and turned slowly to look. A tiny gray creature was on his kitchen table, rippling with muscles and oozing slimy drool from between fangs too big for its tiny head. Ray put his hand out towards the creature. Easy now, he said, and it lunged, snapping its giant teeth at him and causing him to jump back. We can talk about this, Ray said, his eyes moving around the room in search of a weapon. He started to back up towards the knife rack on the counter. The creature seemed to sense the threat and it leaped from the table jaws wide open and fangs headed for his face. Then something smacked it mid-jump and sent it flying into the wall or it collapsed to the ground. Gary ran over and beat the thing with a baseball bat until it was just a stain on the kitchen tiles. When he turned around, heaving breaths of adrenaline, Ray was smiling at him. Hell yeah, Daryl Strawberry. Good thing you never listened to your mom and put your stuff away. Your bat was in the yard. Sit on it. Ray said with a scowl. Lucy rolled into the room behind Gary. Ray threw his arms up. There are steps back there, too. They're easier, she said. We have more important things to talk about, Gary told them both. You're right, Ray said with a nod. Go bots or transformers? Still transformers, Lucy said with conviction. I mean, how do we stop this thing? Gary interrupted. People are going to keep using that payphone. They're probably all trying to call for help from it right now. The demons will be all over town. I have a plan, Ray told him. But you have to answer the question first. Gary sighed. Transformers? Ray threw his arms up again. Well, fine. I have tickets to the GoBots movie that we missed when it came out in March, and they're re-releasing for Christmas. But I'll just find someone else to go with. Gary slapped himself in the forehead. 
I still like GoBots. I just think Transformers are better. We didn't miss that movie in August, did we? Why? What was more important? What's your plan? Lucy said, stepping between them. Take it to the source, duh. Ray shot Gary a last dirty look. The witch that cursed the payphone has to have a way to undo it. Maybe if we kill her, her curses will die with her. Lucy responded. Ray looked impressed. Okay, I don't completely hate you. How are we going to get her with demons all over the street? Gary asked. I have a plan for that, too. Ray gave a sly smile. Give me that holy water of yours, he said, tearing a piece of loose leaf out of a nearby trapper keeper. A few minutes later, Gary was pedaling his bike down the street towards the witch's house. Lucy was skating beside him and pulling a radio flyer wagon by its handle. Ray was sitting in the wagon. Each time a demon appeared in the street, snarling and prepared for murder, Ray pulled a paper ball from the container of holy water and used his spitball gun to fire it and send the howling demon running in the opposite direction. It's working, Gary whooped. Then an enormous monster was standing right in front of him. He tugged his handles and swerved, but his bike crashed and he was sent tumbling across the street. Lucy cried out and let go of the wagon handle as she swerved herself to avoid the beast's massive legs. The wagon rolled a few feet but came to a stop right in front of the thing. It leaned forward on a serpentine neck and glazed yellow eyes stared directly into Ray's. Not knowing what else to do, he raised his gun and blew a spitball point blank into the thing's face. It bounced off the monster's snout with a sizzle of steam and then a long forked tongue came out to lick the monster's scaled lips. Crap, Ray said. The snake-like jaws of the demon unhinged and spread wide, ready to swallow him. Ray just reacted and threw the whole container of holy water down the creature's gullet. It froze for a moment, then burst into flame and collapsed in the road. Hell yeah! Ray shouted, bounding to his feet and pumping his fist. That was all I had, you idiot! Lucy snapped as she rolled over towards him. Who's going to eat me? I didn't see you doing anything. Gary stumbled over, a hand to his head. Guys, we're here. All three turned to look up the old house on the hill. Any idea how to kill a witch? Lucy asked. Beats me, Gary said. Everything beats you, Ray told him. You don't. You'll never know. We didn't get to play because the roller rink got overrun with demons. We'll just wing it then. Lucy said, leaving them behind to skate up the hill towards the old house. The boys grumbled and ran after her. When they got to the towering front door, Lucy reached up and rang the doorbell. Seriously? Ray snapped. Well, I don't know. We're not trick-or-treating. Guys! Once he had their attention, Gary pointed towards the open door. Shall we? I don't see what choice we have, Ray said, stepping past him into the creepy old house. Lucy looked at Gary and shrugged her shoulders. Then she stepped inside as well. When Gary followed her in, the door slammed shut behind him. That can't be good, he said. They were standing in a foyer before a winding staircase under a crystal chandelier. A candelabra burned under an old painting of a frightening woman with an intense stare on each wall at their sides. When they looked up the stairs, mainly to get away from the terrifying painting in the glow of the many candles, they saw her. She was standing on the landing, looking down at them, her white hair wisps jutting out in every direction. She pointed down at them with a bony finger. You dare come into my home? She bellowed from above, her voice shrill and piercing. Below, the children shivered. Lucy swallowed and stepped forward. I know that Joey and those other boys are total jerks, she said. But you need to remove the curse. It's hurting innocent people. Suddenly, the witch was right before them. No one had ever seen her move. They all gasped. No one in this town is innocent, she said. They tormented my mother and her mother before her just like they do me now. I never did anything to you, Gary said. The witch glared at him. You and your friend over here dared each other on Halloween to come to invade my house. You were so bent on winning that you didn't even think about the fact that you were breaking into someone's home. Ray spoke quietly out of the corner of his mouth when he said, She's right. We did do that. I'm sorry, Gary said then. We were messing around. We didn't mean any harm. Please, people are dying down there. The witch gave a big toothy grin. Yes, and they will all die before it's over, and so will you. 
What was that strange coin you put in the payphone? Lucy asked her. It belonged to Karhan. He would give it to the dead when they crossed the river Styx. Like Clash of the Titans, Gary exclaimed. He and Ray high-fived. The witch shot him a stern look and then continued. It was passed through my family for generations. The coin is a link between our world and the underworld. And now that payphone is the connection. That's kind of badass, actually, Ray said. When Lucy glared at him, he said, What? Caron is rad. How do we stop the curse? Gary demanded to know. We have to fix this or it's going to ruin Christmas forever. The witch laughed at him. <laughs> the only way to stop the curse is to get the coin back. And you won't be able to do that because none of you are ever going to leave this house. The boys backed up until they hit the closed door. The witch's smile returned. With a long black fingernail, she caressed each boy's cheek. Then a whistle made her turn her head. She was just in time to see Lucy slam the candelabra down on her robe. It caught fire quickly, and she screamed. The witch stumbled away and fell, rolling on the ground as the flames grew in intensity. She started to scream then, and she writhed in agony as she was consumed by fire. When she fell still, and all remaining was her charred corpse, Gary reached behind him and tried the door. He sighed with relief when it came open. You're growing on me, Ray said to Lucy as they left the house. Like a wart? She said with irritation. No, Ray said, shaking his head. Like a friend. That's sweet, Gary chimed in. Now we have to go back to where it all began and get that coin so we can end this nightmare. We have to go to that damned payphone, Ray agreed. Literally. Lucy added. So, we're like the three amigos, Gary said as they headed back down towards the street. Except, cooler. My dad watches that, Lucy said. We're Spidey and his amazing friends. I'm Firestar, you're Spidey, and Ray's Iceman. Definitely grown on me, Ray said with a smile. You want to go see GoBots with me? Seriously? Gary snarled. Ray laughed, but it didn't last long. When they were back on the street, they saw the full extent of the carnage. There were smashed cars and wrecked houses, downed trees and power lines. Lightning crashed in the sky above, and rain started to fall with force. None of them said anything else as they walked towards the roller rink, Lucy still on her skates. They were doing their best to remain vigilant, to watch for stray demons hungering for human flesh. Terrified screams sounded in the distance. When they reached their destination, a pair of legs wearing skates came rolling out of the open door. The kids cringed at the sight and feared finding the rest of the body inside. Do you think they're all dead? Lucy asked, breaking the silence. The boys just nodded. Do you think once the demons kill everyone at a location they were called to, that they return to hell? Gary asked as they approached the door. God, I hope so, Ray said. When they stepped back into the roller rink, they all clamped hands over their mouths to avoid being sick. There were body parts scattered everywhere, blood dripping from the walls and ceiling, and a lone pair of skates still spinning around the track. The smell is horrible, Lucy choked. Let's just get that coin and get this over with. Gary said. They hurried forward, navigating the body parts like it was a minefield, until they made their way back to the payphone. How do we get the coin out? Lucy asked, inspecting it. Watch out, Ray said, moving her aside. He reached up and kicked the phone. It rattled, and some coins came out, but not the cursed one the witch had put in it. Do it again, Gary shouted. Keep doing it. Not so fast, a voice said from across the room. When the kids looked that way, they saw a translucent man with enormous wings and long, razor-sharp claws walking in their direction. All three of them commenced beating on the payphone, kicking it and punching it. Quarters were raining out everywhere. Where is it? Gary shouted. It's gotta be here. The demon reached them. The clawed hands shot forth and seized both Ray and Lucy around the throat, lifting them high into the air. Gary looked from his squirming friends to the payphone, unsure of what to do. Back away from the phone or I will cut off their heads, the demon told him. Gary didn't trust that the demon wouldn't do that anyway, but he didn't know if the coin would come out if he hit the phone again. If it didn't, the action alone might be enough to cause the thing to kill his friends. Okay, he said, raising his hands. Just please, don't hurt them. Go, 
the demon boomed. For emphasis, he squeezed his hands. The children in them kicked and struggled, their faces going purple. Okay, okay, Gary shouted, backing away. Then he stopped and did his best to duplicate the crane kick he saw in Karate Kid. His left leg came down as his right leg shot up and hit the payphone with a bang. A filthy old coin came tumbling out of the coin slot and landed on the floor. It wobbled back and forth with a rattling sound before falling flat. The winged demon disappeared, and Ray and Lucy fell from the air to the ground where they coughed and gasped for air. Gary bent down and picked up the witch's coin, stuffing it into his pocket. He would bury it somewhere where no one else could use it for evil. Ray and Lucy got to their feet, wiping the gore they fell in off of their clothes. Nice kick, Lucy said with a smile. Ray clapped his friend on the shoulder. Hell yeah, Gary son. Wax on, wax off. The GoBots ticket is yours again. I had no intention of going with you, Lucy said to him as they navigated the carnage on their way to the front door. I vote we start using the word heck, Gary said as they stepped outside. Agreed, Lucy said. They looked around at the two quiet streets. You think they're all gone? Ray asked the others. I hope so, Lucy answered. If not, we'll just find a way to beat them, Gary said. We're a pretty good team. Still not the three amigos, Ray said as they headed down the street. Lucy laughed, and Gary sighed. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Damned Payphone, by Kisto Healy author of twisted horror tales, as well as innovative science fiction and epic fantasy stories, Kisto is a genre author with an unstoppable imagination who writes seven days a week and tries to write at least one story or chapter every single day. It's his biggest passion. The only thing that means as much as his writing is being a dad to his awesome kids. He also dabbles in art and music and being an interesting person. You can find out more about Kisto Healy by visiting kistohealy.blogspot.com. That's C-H-I-S-T-O-H-E-A-L-Y dot blogspot.com. He can also be reached personally on his Twitter handle, at Kisto Healy. You can also find additional Twisted Horror Tales by Kisto on Amazon.com, and by searching our archives right here on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights by searching his name. A quick shout out to the brand new voice actor portraying Lucy in tonight's episode, Damned Payphone. It is none other than Amelia McSorley. Does that last name sound familiar? It just so happens Amelia, or as I finally refer to her as Millie, is my granddaughter. Thank you, my dear. I hope to use your talents again on Fear from the Heartland. When a father gets his son a ventriloquist dummy for his birthday, things begin to get strange. And now, for your indulgence, Longjaw by Man with Two Faces. I was running as fast as I could, but I knew it was gaining on me. I swear it was trying to step in every puddle so I knew it was running faster. I turned my head where I could see it. Its arms were limp as they swung back and forth in front of its torso. Its disjointed jaw bounced up and down, making an uneasy chattering sound. And its plastic-like face was splattered in mud. How could I ever let this happen? It all started when my dad came home from work an hour late. Being the realist that I was, I figured he stopped for groceries or something. I guess I was half right when he came in carrying a box about a human child's size. You mind helping me with this, James? He asked. As I went to help him carry the box, I got a much closer look at it. It looked like an antique. The box was made of very smooth decorative wood and the edges of the opening were made of a reddish metal. After we placed the box on the coffee table in the living room, I asked Dad, What's in the box? It's a surprise for your birthday tomorrow, he replied. How much did this cost? That doesn't matter. 
He shouldn't worry about that. Expensive. Ever since my mom died, dad would always buy me far too expensive presents, mostly on stuff I don't need. I would really want a new mattress for my room. Mine feels like a pile of rocks, and I find it really hard to sleep at night because of this. I was still thankful for whatever was in the box, of course, but I have to admit that the thing I was looking forward to most tomorrow was my friends coming over to hang out. That night when I was lying in bed trying to sleep, I heard a slight tapping coming from somewhere outside of my room. It stopped as quickly as it started, so I overlooked it. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. Giving up, I turned on my phone to see that I had been trying to sleep for a little over an hour. In about 45 minutes, it would be my birthday. I began to hear the tapping again. It wasn't loud enough to wake anyone up, but it was certainly annoying. Unlike the first time I heard it, this time it didn't stop. A continuous tap that felt like it was digging into my brain. Eventually, enough was enough, and I crawled out of bed and left my bedroom. I followed the tapping around the house, soon being led to the box sitting on the coffee table in the living room. I sat on the couch, and the tapping continued. Not being able to hold back, I began to open the box. I woke up from my dad nudging my head with his foot. I sat up and looked around to see that I had slept on the floor outside the living room. What are you doing down there? Dad asked. I don't know. I, I couldn't finish my sentence as I saw the box laying on the coffee table. That's when I remembered opening the box and seeing two deep reflective gray eyes on a beastly looking doll that slightly resembled a dog. What's in the box? That's why you were sleeping on the floor? Dad asked me. Go on and look inside. It's your birthday now. I stood up and slowly walked toward the box. I opened it to see not a dog, but a ventriloquist dummy. The only resemblance to the doll I had seen last night was the eyes. The dummy had pale skin, a big nose, and bright red hair made of the same material that the rest of the dummy's head was. The bottom jaw was oddly missing from the head, but I did find it under the dummy's body which was wearing an all-black suit. The bottom jaw had teeth carved into it, which I found weird since the top jaw didn't have any teeth and the string that I would pull to open and close its mouth was the same string that holds the bottom jaw to the rest of the head. I slipped the string through a hole under the top jaw where I could grab it behind the back of its neck. I tied the string on the end so the bottom jaw doesn't fall off. The way the jaw hung there made it look much longer than it was. Do you like it? Dad asked. Of course, I replied. I saw it in a store window on my way home from work yesterday and thought of you and how you used to love ventriloquism, Dad said. I did always love ventriloquism. I had a ventriloquist act in my school talent show. While I was a talented ventriloquist, I wasn't a very good comedian. I didn't get any laughs. I would have been better off if the audience had booed me off stage. I put on a smile and sat the dummy on my lap. Through the dummy, I said, Hello, James, Dad. I'm Mr. Longjaw. You don't mind if I stay here a while, do you? Dad laughed as he said, You can stay as long as you like, Mr. Longjaw. The doorbell rang and I jumped up, setting Mr. Longjaw back in the box as I ran to the front door. When I answered it, hoping to see my friends, I was struck with disappointment as I saw my Uncle Zeke instead. I made sure that disappointment wasn't visible when he saw me, however. Hey there, birthday boy, Uncle Zeke said. How old are you today? I'm gonna need an answer. I really don't know. I'm 13, I said. What? You're not that old yet. Uncle Zeke had bright blonde hair and even brighter blue eyes. Being my mom's brother, he was the closest I've ever seen of her. Genetically speaking, Uncle Zeke went over to the living room as the doorbell rang again. I opened the door to see my two closest friends, Rebecca and Tyler. Rebecca was a kind soul, but she was an absolute freak for the supernatural. Tyler, while also kind, freaked out with any mention of anything unnatural. Happy 13th, dude, Tyler said. That makes Rebecca younger than both of us. Rebecca punched Tyler in the arm. James is only a week older than me. I let Tyler and Rebecca in, and when we got to the living room, I saw Uncle Zeke holding Mr. Longjaw jokingly pulling up and down on the string, chattering its teeth. 
Uncle Zeke noticed me and laid Mr. Longjaw on his lap before saying, Hey, James, would you like to introduce me to Mr. Longjohn? Longjaw, I corrected. Uncle Zeke picked up Longjaw and carried it over to me. As soon as I touched it, the bottom jaw fell off and bounced off the floor. Damn it! I picked up the bottom jaw and realized that the knot I had tied on the string was too thick for it to go through the hole. There was no possibility that it could have fallen off, and I needed to untie it to put it back on. When I got up, I made Mr. Longjaw say, Sorry, the sight of James made my jaw drop. Wow, dude, you're really good at that, Tyler said. You should really look into being a professional ventriloquist, Rebecca said. How do you do that? Uncle Zeke asked. After a couple of hours goofing off with everyone, Dad left the room to answer his phone. When he came back, he said, James, that was the hospital calling. They need me in the ER today. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Keep Uncle Zeke out of the fridge. All right, Dad. See you tonight, I responded. The thing is, you might not. They need me to work late tonight. Okay, guess I'll see you tomorrow then. Happy birthday, buddy. After Dad left, we continued to goof off until it got late. After Rebecca and Tyler left, I put on a ventriloquist show for Uncle Zeke. You amaze me, James, he said. I don't know how you managed to throw your voice like that. I don't either, I said. It just kind of came naturally to me. Well, I better get going. I'll be sure to tell your dad you did a good job keeping me out of the fridge. I went to the bathroom as Uncle Zeke left. When I came back to the living room, Mr. Longjaw was gone. I figured that I had just misplaced it, so I just went to bed. I didn't stay in bed for long, though, as I heard a loud bang coming from the living room. When I went in there to check it out, I saw the box that Longjaw had come in on the opposite side of the room. This shocked me. There was no possible way for it to get there. I was too tired to worry, so I picked up the box and locked it in my closet. Once again, I wasn't quite able to sleep on my current mattress, and eventually I began to hear the tapping. I was expecting it to sound like it was coming from my closet, but I quickly realized that it sounded as though someone was knocking on the front door. I got out of bed and walked over to the front door. The knocking stopped as I got over there. I looked through the peephole. Nothing. I turned around to go back to bed when I heard the knocking again. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife for protection, but just the thought of ever needing to use it made me uneasy. Once again, the knocking stopped as I approached the door. I looked through the peephole and saw nothing again. I slowly opened the door to see no one around. I grabbed my house key from right inside the door before closing and locking the door as I went outside. I didn't want anyone getting in while I was looking around. I started looking around the house when I noticed something in the bushes. It looked like a hand. It was a hand. Mr. Longjaw's hand. Somehow, Longjaw got outside and was thrown in the bushes. I figured this was just a prank that Tyler, Jessica, or Uncle Zeke was playing on me, so I said, Ha ha, very funny, before grabbing Mr. Longjaw and unlocking the door. The door wouldn't open. The top lock was locked as well, but you can't lock the top lock from the outside. I gripped tighter on the knife as I unlocked the top lock and went inside. If this was a prank, it couldn't have been any of the earlier suspects because none of them had keys to the house. That's when I thought, Dad, he didn't need to go to work. It was all a part of his elaborate scheme, a prank beyond all pranks. So I yelled, Dad, this isn't funny anymore. Give it up. No response. I began to hear my phone ringing, so I put Longjaw down on the couch as I go to my room and check who it is. It's Dad. Of course it is. He hears me yelling and calls me to avoid suspicion. I answer saying, Dad, stop. This isn't funny. With which he responds, What are you talking about? Listen, we need to talk. My heart skipped a beat. He was talking pretty loudly into the phone, but I didn't hear his voice around the house. About what? I ask. Uncle Zeke, Dad replied. Did you see anyone around when he left? No, I went to the bathroom as he left. What happened? Someone was in the back seat of his car and stabbed him in the back of his neck, causing him to crash. He arrived here a few minutes ago. We don't know if he's going to make it. I dropped my knife before dropping to my knees. I looked around my room to see that my closet door was slightly open. I grabbed my knife again and stood up, walking toward the closet door. 
I opened my closet the rest of the way. Nothing was in there. That was the problem. I ran to the living room to see Mr. Longjaw sitting upright in its box with its bottom jaw laying on his lap. What are you? I asked. All realist thoughts fled from my head as Longjaw lay down on its back and the box closed around it. That's when I told myself, enough of this shit. As I walked over to the box, knife in hand, and opened it, the dog creature I had seen before jumped out at me, pushing me onto the couch. I tried grabbing it, but it wasn't showing any signs of stopping, so I sliced at it with my knife, causing it to let out a loud whimper and fall back onto the coffee table. That's when I looked into its reflective gray eyes. I woke up by my dad shaking me on the couch. James, James, are you okay? Dad screamed. What happened? I asked. That's what I should ask you, Dad replied. I came in here and you were passed out on the couch with cuts all over your face. Mr. Longjaw, the dummy. It's alive, I said. It did this to me. James, I'm going to need you to tell me the truth, Dad said. Why was I stupid enough to expect him to believe that? I had to tell him a lie instead. We went outside yesterday and I fell into some bushes. That's why my face is cut up and my mattress is uncomfortable, so I chose to sleep on the couch. Why didn't you tell me your mattress was uncomfortable? I would have gotten you a new one, Dad said. Here, I'll get you one tomorrow. Why not today? Because it's 11 o'clock at night today. You didn't think it was morning, did you? Well, you're going to have to spend one more night on that mattress. I need the couch so I can watch my shows. All right, I said as I stood up. That's when I remembered something. The knife that I was holding had disappeared. However, it wasn't long before I found it since the blade was sticking out of my bed right where I would be sleeping like my mattress could get any less comfortable. That night I had a dream. You'd expect it to be a nightmare, but instead, I dreamt up a plan to get rid of Longjaw, pretty much chaining up the box while it was still inside and lighting the box on fire. The problem was, Dad wouldn't appreciate it if I lit my birthday present on fire, and it's not like I could tell him that I didn't like it so he'd take it back. I clearly enjoyed playing with it. That's not the problem, though. The problem is that Longjaw is threatening me, and I'm pretty sure it was the one who attacked Uncle Zeke, who I regrettably discovered had died from his injuries. That morning, I called Rebecca and Tyler and told them everything. Tyler responded, We have to kill that thing. Damn, this kind of thing isn't supposed to happen in real life. While Rebecca responded, Cool, it's about time I get to slay a demon. I told them to come over as I put Longjaw's bottom jaw back on. I then walked over to Dad's room to see if I could get him in the mix, but was instead met with a note that read, James, I'm out getting a new mattress for your room. Love, Dad. I guess Dad's never going to find out what happened today. When Rebecca and Tyler arrived, I picked up Longjaw and showed it to them. He looks like a dummy, Tyler said, and I'm not talking about the doll. Hang on, Tyler, Rebecca protested. Maybe it's just hiding its true self. Forget this, Tyler said. I should have realized that a living ventriloquist dummy was stupid. I'm going to the ice cream place down the street. If either of you wants to join me, you're welcome. Tyler leaves and Rebecca gives me a pitiful expression. I'll go on. I know you like him, I said. Thank you, James, Rebecca said just before she left. Tyler was right. You are stupid. I said before throwing long jaw across the room. I sat down on the couch and began to cry. I then turned my head to see long jaw sitting up staring at me. That's when I thought of something. You're just a stupid piece of shit, I said. Long jaw then stood up. The only part of it still limp was its bottom jaw hanging by the string. I smiled as I opened the front door. You're just a shitty little bitch and you should piss off. I darted out the front door and passed Dad's car as it began to chase me. I stupidly ran into the woods. The puddles splashing behind me made me realize it was running faster than I could. I looked behind me to see that its arms were limp again, swinging back and forth and the mud from the puddles had splattered all over its face. I then took out my phone and video called Rebecca and Tyler. When they answered, I showed them long jaw behind me. Shit, don't stop running, dude, Tyler yelled. I'm going to stop running. I yelled back. I put my phone in my pocket before stopping. I grabbed a stick that seemed pretty thick. 
As soon as Longjaw caught up with me, I swung the stick at it, breaking off the bottom jaw, causing Longjaw to stop running. Take this, Mr. Longjaw! I yelled as I swung the stick once more, knocking off its head into the mud. Longjaw's body falls limp as I pull out my phone to show my friends on the video call. You went for the head? That's so cool, Rebecca said. I then hung up the call and walked back home. When I got home, I saw that Dad's car was in the driveway. I went inside to look for him, and all I found was the same note on his door. Then I remembered. I saw Dad's car when I left. I opened the door slowly to see Dad's dead body hanging over the side of his bed. On his back was a note that read, Don't you recognize your dad's handwriting? Then I heard a faint tapping sound coming from behind me. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Longjaw by Man With Two Faces. If you'd like to find out more about Man With Two Faces, hook up with him on Instagram at www.instagram.com slash M-A-N-W, the number two, faces. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.